Hello, hello, hello. Oh my God, so good to see so many people again in person. And I'm incredibly excited to look a little bit behind the scenes of Europe's Angel Mafia with you. And David Letterman would say my next guest needs no introduction, but I still would love to do a very quick one. So big welcome, Sophia. You have been one of Europe's most active angels, but you have also started your career at Spotify being global marketing lead and then switched sides, basically working for Atomico as a partner. And very interesting, she built the angel program at Atomico. So there's a lot of intersection between VCs and angels working together. So great to have you here. And you. Tavid, amazing to have you here as well. So you're number one at Skype, right? So the, the person who joined Skype first and then founder of WISE, which has been one of Europe's greatest uh, success stories, uh, an incredible IPO this year. So big congrats. And you've gone through the whole journey as a founder. But now I think you're changing next year. So you're becoming a full-time angel. So excited to learn more about this. So let's rock and roll and go into the discussion. And why is it so exciting to speak about angels ex exactly at this time now? Because I think for the first time in 30 or 40 years, it's really the European VC ecosystem that is getting disrupted upside down. So we see a lot of US funds coming over. But I think one interesting thing is that we have a first cohort of super angels that can basically lead Series A or B rounds themselves. So we've seen Daniel backing Helsing in 100 million Series A. And I was a little like, wow, OK, it's a single person. And so let's get into the discussion. And maybe, Sophia, to start with, um, we, we spoke a little bit about the roles that angels play in the VC ecosystem. Maybe you can elaborate a little bit how they fit into the VC ecosystem and what roles angels actually play there. Yeah, no, sure. Um, I mean, I think an angel can play an incredibly important role in a company's journey. I think in the early days as a founder, when you're before backing from anyone, uh, I think also just emotionally having someone like a Tavet who believes in you or us, I think that communicates something super important to them. So I think that's the kind of first thing. Someone is actually with you on this journey. Maybe that makes you realize that I actually need to build this company now. It's just, just a, an idea. Um, and then, of course, the sort of experience that other angels have that they can share. So when I joined Spotify, I had no prior experience to doing something similar. And I think for me, it would have been extremely beneficial to talk to someone who had been on a growth journey like that. So sharing the insights, the lessons learned, and sort of the, the roller coaster it is to build a company. I think sometimes you um, maybe think that it's just you and that your company that is so crazy. But you know, having then someone or so, a couple of people that can tell you, no, this is normal. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a bit of a roller coaster, and it's a lot about sort of shutting down fires and surviving more or less and navigating the landscape. So I think angels mostly, you know, play an important role as sort of a sounding board and a mentor. But then also, of course, coaching when it comes to how to prepare for, you know, a seed round and also open doors and network. Mm -hmm. So I think access to later stage capital is so much easier if you have a well round of experienced angels on board. What role does sourcing play there? Because compared to the US or China, Europe is incredibly decentralized. So we're in Helsinki now, but then there are companies in Berlin. Eastern Europe, London, Paris, so many clusters that are so different, different languages. Is it that angels also kind of do the groundwork early on and kind of give more transparency into what deals are interesting for VCs? Or? Sorry, repeat that question. If, if there are more local hubs with angels, what's that? Yeah, just on the, if I look at the sourcing, if I'm a venture capital fund, it's so difficult to cover entire Europe because it's so decentralized. Okay. And yeah, got basically, it. do angels play like an important role bringing up the deals that are maybe interesting into the VC ecosystem to just show them? Yes, I think definitely so. So uh, normally when you see VCs covering a region, when they come into that region, they want to meet with interesting founders, but they normally also take time to drink coffee with uh, prominent angels in that area. And that is because they want to get a grip of what's going on and what are these people looking at. Uh, uh, and I think if you have worked with someone and backed the company and that person later on bets on a few companies, that's the perfect sort of source uh, uh, deal source mechanism that you uh, want to see. So I think angels play a big role in that as well. They are kind of the bridge between the, the young generation of founders mm -hmm. and the later stage capital, I would say. Cool. Thanks so much. David, I mean, you've been a founder yourself the last 12 years. And um, but I think you did a quote recently where you said, I completed my entrepreneurial dream and now you want to change being a full-time angel. Next year, you already did 100 angel investments, which is super impressive. What excites you to be an angel full-time now and what, what will be your strategy to, to invest going forward? 
So, I mean, for me, it, it took 10 years to build one iconic company in Europe. 2010, when me and Christo were getting started, we just literally had a dream of doing something better. Yeah. And now it's taken us 10, 11 years, you know, from launching the company, not knowing what we're doing, you know, to scaling it really quickly, realizing that, you know, the, it's ours to win. And yeah. this year we took the company public and it's been an amazing 10-year journey and literally the entrepreneurial journey full circle and kind of fulfills a dream in, in that sense. But it's 10 years for one company. So now in the next 10 years, I'd love to see if, how can I help 100 or 1,000 companies. And I think there's, like to me, like there are so many ways you can kind of uh, cut being an angel. Is it check size? Is it experience? The most important thing for me is actually bringing your own experience. You know, it's about like, you want people supporting you who have real scar tissue. You know, scar tissue comes from being a founder and, you know, there is stuff happening all the time. Or scar tissue comes, you know, if you're an early operator in a business, you know, if you are there within the first few dozens of people and you end up building up one significant part of the company, you have lots of scar tissue. And so, if you're a founder who is raising money, so who do you want the money from? Somebody who's got serious scar tissue or someone who spends her life looking at spreadsheets. That's, that's well something I would be super excited to touch down on. You spoke a little bit about personal experience as a founder where you've gone, I guess, through so many ups and downs, highs and lows that you can now basically give ex experience to founders. What lesson did you have to learn the hard way in the last 10 years? Like, what was the lesson where you thought, oh, oh my God, that, that was something I really had to learn the hard way myself? I mean, I think, you know, there, what is the old saying that, uh, you know, the, the smart person learns from other people's mistakes and, uh, and the less smart one doesn't learn from their own mistakes. And I think when it comes to founders, they're usually pretty smart, but also pretty stubborn. So many times you do need to make lots of mistakes. But it, it's, I think the question is, it's a little bit about kind of, it's about training your kind of, uh, your um, getting your body to like, act without thinking, and for that you need to bump against the wall a few times. Eh? Mm -hmm. And only then your body is trained to do these things right. Yeah. I think everyone needs to go through a few of these cycles, like you hire the wrong person. The question, come, like, the question is how quickly do you, do you fire them? It's yeah. really, it's not about the mistakes, it's about how quickly can you learn from these mistakes and how quickly yeah. can you correct it. You know, even, even at a later stage in a business, you still need to make mistakes. You need, because mistakes oftentimes correlate to risk. Yeah. You don't need to make the stupid ones, but like, you still need to take risks. And the question is, the speed of the cycle, so that's what makes all the difference in the end. Yeah. And if you look into backing new founders, what, what things are important for you? So when you speak to a new founder and given all the learnings that you've done in the last 10 years, um, what one, two, three things are most important for you that you want to see in a founder to, to say, hey, I'm, I'm backing you and I'm believing in you? So first thing was actually really important is why is someone starting a company? You know, yeah. what SARS that say want to spend the next 10 years of their life fixing this particular thing in the world? You know, I think, you know, unfortunately too often it's about the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that me or, or anyone is really good at figuring out the wrong reasons. And the wrong reasons might also create for good outcomes, but, but if we're talking about the really iconic companies that we all want to see built, I think there's something about the founders having an attachment to the problem and then figuring out like, hey, I'm actually happy to go in the trenches for 10 years and I'm going to get shot at, at I'm going to be shot at And often at also time. having experienced the problem themselves because then they're the best person solving it. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I think there's multiple ways. Like one very classic way is you go and solve your own problem. I think there are other equally valid ways of starting it, but that's a very, a very good one. Like that's how, that's how we started at Vice. Yeah. But you know, it's about attachment to the problem and then it's about uh, does that person and team to the have the grit because the journey is not easy. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. And maybe Sophia, since, since you explained a little bit the VC ecosystem, how they work with angels, um, I think many founders here don't know that VCs sometimes have very professional programs actually formally engaging with angels. And those programs are very different. So some, some VCs make it public. I think you built the Atomico Angel program, uh, which is basically a public uh, program uh, having a lot of angels involved. Some do it more James Bond MI6 style, so they have a secret kind of 
force of angels that they work with, and those angels deploy the capital under their own name, but then it's sometimes the, the money of a fund. Could you maybe explain a little bit those programs that you know, and also your experience from building the Atomico program? And then I would love to get both of your takes, what, what you think about such, such programs, and what advice you would give a founder if, if you have one of those angels that wants to invest in your company. Yeah, sure. No, so I think you build a long-term relationship when you're investing in someone's company either if you're an angel or a VC. And I think that relationship is you know, going to thrive if you're honest and, and transparent with where money is coming from and who you are and what you can offer. And especially today, there's so much money in the market, you need to be really clear with sort of what you bring to the table. Uh, so if you ask me, I think it makes a lot of sense to be transparent and have a program that is open. Mm -hmm. um, also, the purpose with the Atomico Angel program was to unlock the next generation of angel investors and actually sort of inspire people that maybe themselves hadn't thought about starting to angel invest, but actually with our program, get that sort of little, uh, you know, kick in the butt to actually get going. And, and here's the sort of structure and a format and a group of peers that you can discuss with and also professionals at the VC firm that you can bounce ideas with and pick brains on. So for me, that was massively inspiring. I, you know, having been an angel since I did my first investment in 2012, mm -hmm. uh, I've been on many cap tables. I've done 52 angel investments and 53% <laughs> are female-led. 52? Yeah. Wow. That's but I'm most proud amount. of that 53% are female-led. <laughs> But on most of those cap tables, there has not been many women. I mean, many yeah. times just me. Yeah. So when I kind of started talking about this, it was also coming from a point of frustration. Like I, I got so much out of angel investing. For me, it was also an opportunity to learn from the best. Mm -hmm. So when you back someone, you have probably identified that this person is the front runner in this sector, in this field. Mm -hmm. And if someone is going to make something great out of this, it's this person. Yeah. So for me, having access to those persons was also a way to sort of learn from the best at the time. Mm -hmm. Like it was a lot of years that I was, you know, building Spotify. I can't just lean on that experience. I want to learn from the best of the best that are building companies today. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was such a positive experience, both from a relationship perspective, from a financial perspective, and also kind of a track record perspective. So I think for me, building my angel portfolio was a way to get into the world of becoming a professional VC. And therefore, I just wanted to encourage more people to do it. Obviously, it's hard if you don't have money. And I normally say you should never invest money that you cannot live without. Mm -hmm. But as me and Tavit said, today you can invest like a five ticket and that's you know um, doable and you can get access to then a whole ecosystem of founders and employees so mm -hmm. I think it's a great way to educate yourself and have fun and work with people that are you know about to change the world meanwhile building out your investment portfolio and if you want to go into VC that is a great sort of starting point yeah. and when it comes to the uh, angel programs I'm a big fan of the sort of transparent version. Uh, <laughs> and I think it is a bit tricky if you're not transparent with where the money is coming from because yeah. it can generate problems further down the road. So better to sort of manage ex expectations and be fully transparent and honest with how things are. Yeah. But that's amazing to hear. If I if you allow me an interpretation, you really found your sweet spot where you wake up on a Monday morning, you love what you do because you can, with being a partner at Cherry, back teams from really pre-seed, seed, to Series A and actually act a little bit like an angel, right? Um, with, with some of the investments that you do. Yeah. yeah, no, I think I have the best job in the world. It's it's a ton of fun doing what we do. And, and mainly because you get to meet the people that are building the next generation, uh, you know, global yeah. winners. Tave, what's your take on those angel programs that are kind of formalized by, by venture capital funds? Uh, because something that I often hear from founders is, you know, I mean, whether it's a Sequoia Scout or Excel Scout or whether it's public, non-public, is there a signaling risk associated to it? Because once you have one of those angel scouts in your seed round, and if the fund behind it doesn't preempt the A round, does it already signal to the other funds, hmm, maybe can't be such a great deal? Or is this too detailed looking into this? What, what would be your advice to a founder? So I'm, I'm actually really inspired by, uh, by the angle that we're doing this to grow more angels in Europe. 
Mm -hmm. They're like, I'm very long on Europe and Sarah, so not enough uh, angel investors in Europe. So we need to think about what are the ways that we can kind of grow the next generation of angels. So I think that's great. And, you know, I know that Nicholas is a huge believer in Europe and, you know, he thinks a lot about how do we build the ecosystem because it actually helps him and helps everyone else, uh, everyone else as equally well. Eh? But when it comes to the angel programs, I'm a little, like, I'm a bit more skeptical in general, the angel or scout programs. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, essentially we have three, three parties to a, to a typical angel program. There is a company that they invest in, there is an angel and there is a VC. The VC obviously wins. You know, they get in early, they get more information, no brainer. The angel, also getting a good deal, depending on the terms of the of the deal, you know, they may get free money from the VC as they can invest and they so keep the upside, you know, there are different ways of structuring. I am not so sure that the company wins in the end. Mm -hmm. Because that angel, if the angel wanted to invest, they could invest their own money. Why do they need to be either undercover or publicly mm -hmm. with a venture firm flag? So, so, so non-public ones, I think, are really bad. Yeah. You know, there is a, a question of transparency. So be, and beware if, of the James Bond angels or always ask uh, if it's their own money or whose money it is. <laughs> I, I think that is super, super important. And uh, I would actually love to see it in the, in the round documentation that everybody has to vouch for the source of funds uh, in uh, that sense. But like, so there is a whole question of signaling and value add and not like, I prefer it, uh, I prefer it in a much more clean way. Mm -hmm. Like, if you're fundraising, you want to pick people who are appropriate for this round. Mm -hmm. So if it's an angel round, then you should get into a bunch of angels. It doesn't make sense to take one VC into an angel round, full stop. Mm -hmm. Whether that's through an angel program or not. You know, if you're building a great company, so investors outside will come, will come looking for you. Mm -hmm. And if you're building a not great company, then having an angel in you isn't... Having, an angel, having a scout program angel doesn't help you either. So yeah. I'm, I'm much more for a kind of clean approach and uh, let's avoid yeah. the signaling questions. Uh, make sure you get people who are appropriate for the stage of the business, uh, yeah. you know, including with VC. Like if you, have a, yeah. if you have a VC with a mega fund, wants to invest in a, in a seed stage, there's no benefit for you in it. Yeah. You know, what you should do as a founder is, you should tell the VC, sorry, I'm not taking your money now, but if, you, if you're nice to me over the next 12 months, we talk to you then. And you're going to get much more value out of them this way, mm -hmm. because then they're dying to prove their worth, because yeah. they all have huge value-add programs. Yeah. So they should be directing these value-add programs towards the companies you want to invest in in the next round. Yeah. And, you will, and you can squeeze much more out of them yeah. if you don't take them with a small ticket. Yeah. That's super insightful, and maybe we go down on the on the angel layer only again. Um, since you've both been incredibly experienced angels, done more than 200 deals, I think if I take your aggregate portfolio, how do you get access to those deals and what happens behind the scenes? Because a lot of founders I speak to are surprised that so many people see the pitch deck that they don't know about because everyone speaks about everyone behind the scenes. So I would be super curious What people do you trust, do you network with to get access to deals? And once you look into deals, how do you share them maybe with angel syndicates or other people or, or don't you share deals or uh, what's, what's your kind of approach there? I mean, I think it's a combination, but uh, what I didn't realize before coming into venture was that it's such a relationship driven industry or business. So um, for me, it's been, You know, you back one founder and they're happy with you, then that person spread the word in his or her network and then, you know, there's a sort of a flywheel happening. Yeah. And same thing with angels. Like if you find angels that you share interests with, then maybe sector, you look at the same sectors and geography and stage, it's very, it's, it's, it's fun and, and great to do deals with people that you respect and know have, you know, the relevant background, etc. So I think, you know, it's, it's, um, It's a mix of getting, uh, you know, a WhatsApp with like, oh, you should look at this company, and then someone pinging you on Twitter, sort of uh, totally foreign, but that do something and that have sort of read up upon what I'm interested in, and yeah. then it creates a little snippet on why I should be interested in looking at this company. So, what's the fastest we'll, decision you ever made into backing a founder? Oh, good question. I think it's probably like in, a, in 24 hours. 24 hours. Wow, that's fast. So, I don't know how long Slash is going, but I think there's still tomorrow. So, <laughs> <laughs> feel free to, yeah. to, to pitch to Sophia. <laughs> 
Tavel, what's, what's your behind the scenes networking? Um, how, how, do you, how do you find those deals? Do you just have a full inbox of people that share buy now, pay later and all those kinds of deals with you? Or do you have people that you trust to get this access? I mean, I think it is, uh, a lot of this is, uh, is about recommendations. So, you know, it's about the, the best founders say, end up, you know, networking with each other. And it's a question of like, hey, I'm raising around who should I speak to. So I think, you know, as, uh, as was said, like it's a recommendation uh, network based, uh, which makes it hard for new founders to get in, which is something we should consciously think about. Like, mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we find people who maybe don't have an in to the classic founder network? So I think mm -hmm. that's something which is actually quite important from a diversity point of yeah. view, is that uh, we need to go and uh, look for these people who don't fit into these circles. But, a lot of this goes through recommendations, and if a founder says, hey, like, uh, Tavit's been a fantastic, a fantastic supporter, you should speak to him, then that's how the information moves. But I think then, you know, when it comes to, you know, how do you get around together and who do you uh, share it with, you know, you should really be starting this from an entrepreneur and company viewpoint, like, yeah. what's the best deal for this company? Sometimes the best deal for a company is money in the bank very quickly, they know what they need to build, they're just lacking financial resources to continue executing, that's fine. In that case, it's about get this done very quickly. In other cases, it's about, hey, like, we're still kind of zigzagging, looking for product market fit. Mm -hmm. Let's add someone who has created operations, like yeah. we're doing some kind of a delivery service. So like, okay, let's go get the Vault guys involved. Uh, you know, it's, it's really should start with like, what's yeah. best for the founder and company, what kind of support they need. And I think, you know, as a, as a founder, you should think of this as you are building a network around you. You know, when we raised the first round for WISE in 2011, like, I kind of had like a 360 degree map in front of me, like, mm -hmm. I want someone who knows a lot about banking. You know, for that, you know, we took, we took Mickey Malka, who's built a couple banks in, uh, in South America, who's now mm -hmm. become, with Rubit Capital, uh, one of the best fintech investors in the world. The, back then, he was still an angel. Like, you know, like, okay, who knows about marketing? So we kind of built this map. And I knew that I don't know which of these people I will need mm -hmm. at what point, because I don't know which problems I will run into. Mm -hmm. And there were some people in that list who we probably never really interacted with. That's fine. Yeah. But there are some people who were incredibly helpful, and you don't quite know when it's going to happen. Yeah. And actually, in the same way, we kept on adding people pretty much every round. When we raised a Series C from Andreessen Horowitz, then we added uh, Vikram Pandit, who was ex-CEO of Citibank, mm -hmm. Citigroup, and, uh, and uh, ex-CEO of, of Thomson Reuters. Mm -hmm. you know, we added them as angels at Series C, yeah. but again, like these people can be helpful, so yeah. why not let them put their own money in the game yeah. so you can reach out to them. So I do think you should be adding angels continuously, yeah. but you should like think about it with a company viewpoint, yeah. like what does this founder need? That's super exciting because I think takeaway for you as founders is you, you don't just get the angel and like the personal experience, but you get the whole network around this angel, which can be at different stages, very different in impact, but I think something, something super important. I'd like to make a bold move and basically go away from angels as a feeder for VC funds, but basically comparing them a little bit. So I think one tricky thing about European VC, and I consider myself to be in the same camp, is that we're a little linear and boring in the way we invest, and maybe a little mathematical, because we're going into B2B SaaS models, we look into numbers, we look into scale-ups, but if we look at the really, let's say, more frontier technology topics like BioNTech, where The Strungmann brothers did a 130 million seed round in 2008 at the top of the financial crisis. Or we look into Helsing, where uh, Daniel just did a 100 million Series A round. What I would love to discuss with you on the one hand side, time horizon. So venture capital funds typically have a 10 year time horizon. And is this really long enough today to bring out those amazing companies? So it took you 10 years, 11 years to go public. But uh, if we look at some of the frontier tech companies, it takes 15, 20 years. So Is it really enough to have a 10-year horizon? And would love to get your thought because you're investing out of an evergreen structure where you say, hey, whether it's 15, 20 years, uh, you give the founders the time to just thrive the way they want to thrive. And the second thing is, will there be maybe more angels as better partners for founders when it's about those really bold technology-driven investments where not many European VC funds are really that, that active? So, sorry, long question, but what do you think about timeline to invest and also 
the match of angels versus VCs for, for those very different topics. Cool, yeah, maybe <laughs> I can just start two cents on the angels versus VCs. I think it's all about the mix. So depending on what phase you're in, you're going to need different type of people and uh, advisors. And if you go with founders that are actively building their own company, they're going to have very little time. If you go with the angel that have been a founder that now have freed up time, you're going to get access to someone much more. So I think it, it's good to make sure that you have a variety of people that can actively engage so that you don't have the, the big names, but no one can actually sit down an hour and meet up. Uh, and I think a combination of angels and funds are still the best setup. Mm -hmm. I think it's super interesting what's going on with the sort of time frame of things. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot will happen there. I think for some of the family offices that we work with, that is one of the uh, sort of upsides for them. They can pitch themselves as the sort of long-term investor without you know, compromising the health of the company and their timeline because of their fund cycles. I mean, in a way, the, the founder should be set up to build his company in his pace and in his way mm -hmm. rather than optimizing for you know fundraising or cycles uh. Uh, coming with that so i think you know in the end of the day it's the entrepreneur's market He's, mm -hmm. he or she is the one building the company and i think the investors should be, you know be able to be more flexible and i think that's what we're seeing now in the market yeah. with more growth investments happening and people want to double down on the winners longer etc it's interesting that funds also change. If you look at Sequoia, they've just introduced this holding structure on top of the funds where they can say, okay, we can basically stay in as long as we want and maybe build like a, I don't want to call it Berkshire Hathaway 2.0, but it's, it's an incredible idea. If we look at NASDAQ tech index, uh, how, how they have performed over the last 20 years, having maybe a more long-term thinking in our tech ecosystem, also on the investment side. But what's your take, Tavid? If First of all, a reflection on kind of like what we said before, and like if you're getting some angels involved and getting some mix involved, I think as a founder, what you should do is think about what is the SLA with all of the angels. Like figure out that, hey, if someone says, I'm investing because I'm going to help you, then I agree that, hey, we're going to do a call one hour a month yeah. because we're actually going through these things. Or with other people, be clear that, hey, there's no expecta expectation today, but you know, I might want to reach out to you for this or this. But I think the SLA part is really important because too often you see these super party rounds of 25 angels and then you know, everyone does 25 deals on a, every six months and then they have no time for anything. Like, <laughs> like that's a, I, I've tried that's to the be, Tiger Global Angel model when <laughs> uh, you just have a playbook, <laughs> tag along. Like, I, I've tried to be clear on that like when I was head over heels running TransferWise uh, yeah. and like pretty much what I told uh, angel, uh, angel, the angel, deals, angel deals I did, I said, hey, I'm building my company, I'm busy, so we shouldn't be having coffee but I give you the license to call me mm -hmm. if there's something I can help you because I'm a couple years ahead of you. Yeah. you know, now when I'm doing certain deals, I'm agreeing a very different SLA, again, yeah. depending on what's, what the company needs. Yeah. But switching to the kind of the duration question, it seems to me this is something that very much resonates with entrepreneurs that if I tell them, hey, my capital has no time limits, that seems to be something that people really like because it does take a long time to build companies, especially mm -hmm. if we go to more frontier deep tech areas. It does take a long time. It may take more capital than we think, so that yeah. seems to be one important thing. But I think there's probably one other side to this coin as well, which is really about having skin in the game. You know, I think angels investing their own money there is a very much a skin in the game element. Yeah. Versus, you know, if we look at the venture funds, the investment decisions sometimes get taken by people who have no skin in the game. I think that's also one pretty big difference and it's kind of a question of aligning yourself very closely with the founders and mm -hmm. hey like you know, is it my personal money like I was an entrepreneur just like you I was lucky and, and now I'm putting skin in the game or, or even probably even more important is if you think if you look at then someone who hasn't been a founder but has been an employee has made some money through stock options and they probably have less money but for them to say hey I'm actually I you know 10,000 is a lot of money for me I want to invest that you know, as an entrepreneur, you should, you should be stupid not to take that because that is so much skin in the game from that person. So I think like skin in the game and duration seem to be quite, yeah. quite important. Speaking about skin in the game, maybe one last disruptive question. What idea that you saw maybe in the last 12 months is an idea where you wish you had it yourself that, that you fell in love with, <laughs> if there is one? 
I mean, many probably. But <laughs> my, my sort of uh, little sense check thing is when I meet a team, the energy and the vibe and the culture that they have created, if mm -hmm. I feel like, wow, this is amazing energy in this office, I could definitely see myself go to work here. Mm -hmm. That for me is a little, you know, a good test question. And I met a lot of teams that are on fire and are having so much fun and you can almost touch the energy, like, that's a good sign. Cool, so you're a cool entrepreneur there again. Yeah. You know, as, as a founder, you have always a tendency to think like, hey, I want to do this, but then you, know, you need to remember about the grass is always greener on the other side. Eh? <laughs> you know, if you're a founder, you're like, oh, this is so hard. If you're not, you're like, oh, I wish I was running a company again. So I think I've, I've made the mental shift of uh, not trying to think about that anymore. But, you know, I think the, the area which is exciting and, you know, makes me think I want to do something is anything around kind of climate and energy. You know, I think that the energy transition that we're going to see in the next 10, 20 years, I think it's going to be a huge market pull yeah. for so many companies. So, you know, it's a, it's a great way where you can kind of combine doing investing with having a real impact yeah. and combining these two in one go. And I think there's going to be so many exciting companies built in this area over the next decade. I love this because I think when we look at, at all those energy and carbon topics, it's something where I think in Europe we're in such an amazing position to build global category leaders and to be a front mover where I think a lot of tech topics, you know, we've always said we're behind, we're slower than Silicon Valley and we kind of lost a lot of traction. But I think when it's about climate tech, it's if you look at politics, regulatory environment, it's something where we can really be a front runner globally and I think things start uh, to, to happen. So. I would love to continue for another two, three, four, five hours, but thank you so much. Those were amazing insights. I hope you guys got a little sneak peek behind the scenes of Europe's Angel Mafia. And uh, thanks so much for listening. And yeah, rock and roll. Hopefully we can, um, maybe VC funds are not needed anymore in five or, or 10 years because angels are covering this even full time. Thanks so much. Thank you so much.